Would you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Well, word had gotten out about Jesus, about his teachings, his keen teachings, but also about his amazing miracles and healings and because of that, crowds were frequently following behind him. I, I looked it up. I was really surprised how many times in the book of Mark it notes that, that crowds were around Jesus. We often think about the disciples, but these crowds are always hovering around him. And the passage from today is no exception. It, it begins with a, a not-so-private conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples, those 12 on the inner circle, but just outside of that are the crowds. There's a crowd of people wanting to get close as possible to Jesus, as is so typically the case. Now, imagine, if you will, what someone in that crowd might have seen and heard while Jesus is having this fairly open conversation with his 12 closest followers. Imagine, in fact, if you were there back in the first century Palestine, in this case near Caesarea Philippi, near the foot of Mount Hermon. This is the northern part of the land of the Jews. Now you might be listening if you were standing there with great interest as to what Jesus might be saying to his closest followers. But on this day, on this day, you may be scratching your head because what you have just heard him say, as best as you can, if you heard him clearly and correctly, is you've heard him say that the Son of Man, that's what he would call himself, the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the Jewish religious leaders and be killed before rising from the dead on the third day. Now, this doesn't seem right to you. I mean, in fact, something feels very, very wrong about all of this. And you wonder whether you actually heard correctly what Jesus has said. For folks at that day and time were increasingly convinced that this man from Nazareth was in fact the long-awaited Messiah, the one who was going to be the savior of his people, who would rescue them from the Roman overlords and give back the glory days of King David. How could he possibly be saying now that he would suffer rejection by the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders, and even death? This is crazy talk. Death is what happens to false messiahs, not to one like Jesus, the one that they believe is the real deal because of the miracles that he's been performing and the words that he's been speaking. But it gets even weirder, as we heard moments ago, read in the scripture. Suddenly, Simon Peter pulls Jesus aside and rebukes him. The student rebukes the great teacher. Now, while you agree with Peter that what Jesus has been saying is absurd, you could never have imagined that he would have called him to task. Commentator Hewlett Glower imagines Peter telling Jesus something like this, like he pulls him aside and he says, suffering, rejection, and death are not on the agenda. Prestige, power, and dominion are the agenda. It's David's throne we're after, ruling the nations with power and might. We signed up for a crown, not a cross. Peter's eyes are closed, though. They're closed because of his preconceived ideas about who and what the Messiah would be and what he would mean for the Jewish people. Here's a question I want you to ponder. How often are our eyes closed to the truth about Jesus? because of what we've thought ahead of time he should be. How often are eyes, our eyes closed? The tables are quickly turned, though, when Jesus rebukes Pete, Simon Peter. But there's an interesting little detail. You know, it's funny, every time I read the Bible, something pops up for me that I, that I don't necessarily notice before. And this week it was something that Jesus does. I've never noticed it before. 
it says that Jesus looks at the other disciples. Before he rebukes Peter, he glances over at the other disciples. Now, why would he do that? I think it's because he wanted to make sure that the other disciples were listening. Because I suspect that he figures if Peter is saying this, he's speaking for the whole group. And they're all over there sort of grumbling a little bit and wondering, what's he talking about all this death stuff, this suffering stuff? This is glory that we want. Jesus wants them to hear what he's about to say to Peter. And what does he say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Now, why would he say that? Because Jesus, I mean, rather, Peter at that point, Jesus is saying, Peter has his mind stuck, stuck on the ground, stuck on worldly matters, stuck where it shouldn't be. He's not looking up to God in heaven. And instead, he's in completely the wrong direction. Only later would we all understand that what Peter was inadvertently doing was mimicking Satan, the father of lies, who tried, as we know, to tempt Jesus away from his God-given calling, one that would involve great suffering for humanity rather than a path of easy glory. Jesus is shutting that down before it goes any further. Finally, Jesus expands his focus to include the crowd of which you're a part if you're in this imaginary scenario. And, and what he says now really jars you and everybody else. So now he's not just talking to the, the 12. He's talking to all of the crowd, which means, guess what? That's us. He's talking to us as well. And what does he say? If any want to become my followers... Let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. Denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Jesus are the three keys to saving your life. This isn't just something for the 12, as I said, those closest to Jesus. This is for anybody who wants to be a disciple of Jesus. These aren't just aspirations, but requirements for discipleship. Whether you're a first century disciple wannabe or a 21st century church goer, these are not the easiest words to hear, are they? I mean, in the Western church today, we usually emphasize fellowship and, and, and positive life changings that are brought on with a relationship with Jesus. Not suffering. Not suffering. This isn't what I signed up for, you may be thinking. While the cross, in one form or another, is displayed in almost every Christian church, how often do we really focus on what it means to us personally, on how we might have to carry it. How often do we really think about that? Our church's motto is loving God, worshiping boldly, changing lives. Loving God, worshiping boldly, changing lives. That's a wonderful motto. Nothing wrong with that. But it's a far cry from come join us as we deny ourselves and take on suffering while following the one who was brutally murdered on the most painful execution device ever devised by man. Not so catchy, huh? Well, then how about this one? Losing our lives for Jesus. I'm not sure how many non-Christians, or for that matter, Christians, current Christians, would be drawn to a church with that as its motto, either of those as its motto. But that's what Jesus is telling us and telling everyone who wants to be his follower, to be his disciple, that we have to be prepared to make sacrifices if we are to follow Jesus. And to follow means to imitate, to do as he did as he walked this earth. Of course, it doesn't likely mean the kind of sacrifice that he made on the actual cross. But we are called to pick up a metaphorical cross and simultaneously let go of those things that may be dragging down our relationship with God and with other persons. So let's be clear about what Jesus means and by what Jesus doesn't mean by what he says in today's scripture. So, for example, when Jesus says, 
that we must deny ourselves, he's not telling us to deny ourselves something of something. What he's saying is to deny self, to deny self. Now, in saying that, he's not talking about asceticism as a requirement for discipleship. Asceticism, of course, being the practice of, of harsh denial of comforts. As Lamar Williamson says, asceticism can hand the victory to the self, for self can ride as comfortably on a bicycle as in a limousine. In other words, what he's saying is self-denial can become a reason for puffing up our pride. We can get really proud about the fact that we're giving up all this stuff and we're extra proud about it. Denying ourselves also doesn't mean self-loathing or self-hatred. Jesus never said to hate oneself. In fact, he said just the opposite when he told us that the second part of the greatest commandment is to do what? To love your neighbor as yourself. Part of that means loving yourself as well. In fact, those who don't love themselves find it harder to love others as they often lack a basic respect for human life. I'm, I'm not a psychologist, but I really believe that those who cause physical harm to other persons in all likelihood are those who lack this value of self-love because they couldn't treat another human being that way if they respected themselves and loved themselves. Jesus calls us to love all persons, including ourselves. Self-hatred is not a goal. It's a sickness. Richard Foster, in his book, Celebration of Discipline, which I mentioned last Sunday and I intend to numerous times during the season of Lent, notes that self-contempt claims that we have no worth. Self-denial, on the other hand, declares that we are of infinite worth and shows us how to realize it. Self-contempt denies the goodness of the creation. Self-denial affirms that it is indeed good. And as he phrases it, self-denial is simply a way of coming to understand that we do not have to have our own way. Our happiness is not dependent upon on getting what we want. There's a freedom that comes with that self-understanding, isn't it? it? It opens things up for us. We don't have to have our own way. Commentator Jouette Basler says that at its most basic level, denying oneself means removing oneself from the center of one's concerns, relinquishing status and power in favor of service to others. Once again, loving our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus says also that we must take up our cross. Lamar Williamson points out that the cross, in the cross, that the cross Jesus is instructing us to pick up refers not to the burdens that life imposes on us from without, but rather to painful redemptive actions voluntarily undertaken for others. Now, on the one hand, that's comforting to know that Jesus is not asking us to celebrate the trials and tribulations of life. But on the other hand, it may present us with an even greater challenge because it means that we're to seek acts of service to Christ that often will bring us discomfort and even pain. Finally, we're called to follow Jesus. I've already noted how that connotes imitation. If Jesus is our role model, our, our teacher, our example, then we should mirror his words and actions to the extent practical, practicable and applicable to our situations. In other words, persons in our day and time should be able to see in us evidence of Jesus. We should reflect Jesus' words and actions in our daily lives, and we should be looking to him for guidance. How can we say that we're followers of Jesus if we're not looking to imitate him, if we're not seeking to follow him, if our lives have no bearing or no resemblance, rather, to what we read about Jesus in the scriptures? If there's a complete disconnect between how we speak and how we behave and what we read about Jesus in the Bible... Are we really following him? The sacrifice that we're called to make is rarely of our physical lives, but it does mean sacrifice of our lives in the sense of turning them over to Christ. This is the spiritual discipline of submission 
about which Richard Foster writes in Celebration of Discipline. It's submission to God, but as part of that, it's submission to other persons, becoming a servant of all, as was Jesus, who, says Foster, died not only across death, but also lived across life. He died across death, and he lived across life. Jesus, Foster says, shattered the customs of his day when he lived out the cross life by taking women seriously and by being willing to meet with children. He lived the cross life when he took a towel and he washed the feet of the disciples. This Jesus, who easily could have called down a legion of angels to his aid, chose instead the cross death at Calvary. Jesus' life was the cross life of submission and service. Jesus' death was the cross death of conquest by suffering, Foster says. As I said earlier, Jesus is our example to follow. But what does that look like? Fred Craddock illustrates how our sacrifice in following Jesus' example is, is rarely martyrdom. Craddock says, we think giving our all to our Lord is like taking a $1,000 bill and laying it on the table. Here's my life, Lord. I'm giving it all. But the reality for most of us is that he sends us to the bank and has us cash in that $1,000 for quarters. We go through life putting out 25 cents here and 50 cents there. Usually giving our life to Christ isn't glorious, he says. It's done in all those little acts of love, 25 cents at a time. My wife Kristen and I were talking about this scripture the other day and what it means to deny ourselves and take up our cross and, and follow Jesus. And she brought up her cousin Dwight and his wife, Dorothy, <clears throat> they used to live in Minnesota. And they were fine and successful, and they, <laughs> they left and literally gave up virtually all of their possessions in order to become foreign missionaries with a non-United Methodist organization. And they and their two children have served twice in Liberia, one time when Liberia was consumed by the Civil War, the three-party Civil War. There was, they sent the women and children back to the states. Dwight had to stay back there. They had to have a core group to continue running the, the camp where they were. And there were three weeks with no communication whatsoever. We didn't know if he was alive or dead. They also served in Kenya. <laughs> and usually Kenya is peaceful, and they were there, unfortunately, at a time when it was suddenly consumed by political upheaval. Now, amidst all of this sacrifice, I'm sure if you asked Dwight and Dorothy, they would tell you that they have gained so much, however, in terms of what they've learned about themselves and what's really important in life and in how their relationship with God has deepened and their love for other people has expanded exponentially. Dwight and Dorothy are beautiful examples of the blessings that flow back to us when we answer Jesus' call and deny ourselves, take up our crosses, and follow Jesus. In our own church, we have similar examples of those who have submitted to Jesus Christ and sacrificed their lives in service to him. Jamie and Holly Wall Wallen and their three boys are in Albania because they've denied themselves and taken up their crosses and followed Jesus. And if you've ever spoken with Jamie or Holly or heard them tell their stories, you know how blessed, how very blessed they feel in spite of, or maybe because of the challenges that they're experiencing in the mission field. I know Jim and Susan Wallen would affirm this to be true, although I'm sure they'd love to have them a little closer to home. And another example of such submission to Christ is found in our most recent missionaries supported by our church, Dan and Courtney Randall and their three children. Courtney, of course, is Dulcie Michael's daughter. They're waiting due to COVID 
to gain entrance to Israel so that they can continue giving their lives in foreign missionary service. They've been missionaries before. They're especially focusing on the Palestinians. They too are denying themselves and taking up their crosses and following Jesus. So let me wrap this up quickly by saying this. Most of us, most of us won't be traveling to other parts of the planet in service to Christ. Most of us won't be getting on a plane to go elsewhere or serving in that particular way in submission to Jesus. Instead, we'll be doling out a quarter here and a quarter there, so to speak, as Fred Craddock suggests. But you know, those quarters add up. Those quarters add up, those individual acts of submission, which may not always seem giant and life-changing, over time do make a difference, and they do change the world around us. And now and then, now and then, those quarters that we're doling out do make a big, big impact on the life of another, not to mention our own. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.